Okay, so hi everyone. Um, welcome to day two of the conference. Hi, my name is Avishai. I'll uh, talk about myself in a bit. Um, but first I want to show you something. So uh, I'm in charge of this service at Wix and one of those days I get paged, as you do, and uh, they tell me that uh, my service is slow. So I go to New Relic, which is uh, one of the tools that we use, and look at the service, and uh, it looks pretty nice. I don't know if you see the numbers, but it says uh, 99 percentile, 250 milliseconds, average latency about 204 milliseconds. So everything looks pretty good. So um, I called them back, and I told them, uh, well, my service is fine. Maybe you should check your browser or your internet connection or whatever. Tell me, no, like all of our monitoring systems are, uh, say that your service is slow, and we get complaints from customers in the support center and that kind of stuff. You should check more. You should uh, look at your other monitoring systems. So of course, I go and I look at uh, Grafana, and I see the same numbers. Uh, 99 percentile, 250 milliseconds, mean average latency about 200 milliseconds. That uh, red line here, that's my SLA, 300 milliseconds. So everything is fine. But people are, keep complaining. So um, they tell me eventually to, to go look at the load balancer. So I go and look at the latency at the load balancer, and I see this. Two seconds latency, like uh, P99, 2.2 la uh, seconds latency, and the average latency is somewhere around uh, like uh, 1.7 seconds. And that's insane. That's way, way, way above this red line. That's horrible. So obviously, I've got a problem, but I don't know what the fuck the problem is. Uh, but uh, lucky for me, I'm in a room full of engineers, so maybe one of you can tell me what the problem is. Yeah. No, the load balancing is not really doing much, actually. DNS? Well, DNS is usually always the problem, but not in this case. Actually, your requests are queuing, and uh, when, when they get their turn, they get... Uh, like in, in, a, in a few hundred milliseconds, but to wait their turn, they should spend like f uh, two seconds or more. That is exactly right. That is exactly what is going on. So basically what you're seeing here is the effect of queuing. Uh, requests are queued up in the low blind cell, and they wait for about, um, no, uh, about two seconds just to be serviced before they even get to my application. Therefore my application so shows decent latency, but in fact clients are suffering. They're in pain. So this is the kind of stuff that you get when you don't do resilient design, which is why we're talking about resilient design today. So uh, welcome to Resilient Design 101. Um, I'm, my name is Avishai. I'm Nukerberg on Twitter. And uh, I work for a company called Wix. Now, if you've never heard of Wix before, uh, Wix is a large, very large um, website building platform. We help people build their websites uh, easily, and we host uh, those websites. We currently have about 100 million users. Uh, a lot of websites, uh, tens of millions of them. We have about 500 microservices, about 550, I think, now. Uh, we've got uh, more than 500 engineers. I don't remember exactly how many. Uh, we have about uh, 1,500 employees. We have got offices, and uh, engineering offices in Vilnius, Kiev, here, uh, Nipro, and of course, Tel Aviv and Beersheva. Our headquarters is in uh, Tel Aviv. So that's Wix. Uh, pretty awesome company, and by the way, we're hiring. If you're interested, you know, come talk to us after. We have a booth out there, um, but you don't actually care about that. Like, yeah, Wix is big, complex, blah 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 blah. Yeah, everyone tells you that. So uh, this is the part where I'm supposed to be talking about myself and uh, like impress you with all the cool stuff that I did, so you know that you should listen to me and blah blah blah. So this is me speaking to some random conference. Uh, this is me debugging some stuff. This is me designing some stuff. Uh, this is me coding, because I always code with whiskey, because, you know, vodka is reserved for scripts. Um, and this is me after I deploy that code. And this is me 20 minutes after the deploy when I found the bug in production. Uh, that was not pretty. And this is me later on in the postmortem. Uh, you can pretty much guess how that went. So yeah, not pretty. So let's talk about queues. Um, 
So I want to talk about Keyring theory. And Keyring theory was a mathematical uh, theorem, not theorem, methodology discipline that was invented by a guy named Erlang, which you all thought was a programming language, but actually it's, called a, uh, it's named after a person. Uh, that person was a mathematician that lived in the early uh, 20th century, and he, he worked for the Swedish phone company. Now back then you had people, girls sitting in offices, physically connecting wires to panels, big panels on the walls, and if you want to call someone, you would have to wait for an operator, one of those girls, to hook you up, and you would wait for a very long time. And uh, the phone company hired Erlang to optimize this so people won't, won't have to wait so long in line. So he developed this whole uh, mathematical theorem about how queues work, and he was able to optimize and improve the service very much. And today we use queuing theory for a lot of stuff, from supermarket queues to queues in the stadium, uh, you know, you, play, you go to football matches, of course, uh, and of course, in computers. We use queuing theory when we design computers and software systems all the time. So it's worth knowing a little bit about uh, queuing theory. Of course, queues are everywhere, and not all of them are visible and explicit. Uh, we've got queues everywhere. If you've got a future or an executor, there's a queue somewhere down there. A socket has a queue, always, often more than one. Uh, locks, they don't look like a queue, but in fact, they behave just like a queue. And same goes for callbacks in a synchronous system. So anything is sync, basically, somewhere down there, there is something that behaves like a queue. So, yeah, this is something that is very, very important to actually know. And a queue, basically, is kind of a buffer. It has some capacity. We can store stuff in it. And there is some incoming load. In queuing theory, we'd call it arrival rate. And it goes into the queue. And then we have some service center, some worker, that services the load from this queue. And basically, the service rate is the rate at which we take stuff out of the queue. And we have some strategy for removing some f uh, stuff from the queue and giving it to the service center. That is called the service discipline. Uh, we know a few of those, like uh, FIFO, first in, first out, uh, LIFO, last in, list, uh, first out, priority queue. There's a, even something called uh, an Israeli queue. It's, it's, it is a mathematical definition. I'm, I'm not kidding you. It's basically when you uh, go to the front of the queue and you bring all of your friends with you. Um, <laughs> yes. It is a thing, look it up. Um, and we have latency, which is basically the time you wait in the queue plus the time it takes the service center to service, you know, whatever job that, that has to be done. Now, it is important to remember that the service time is independent of the queue, okay? Anything that goes on in the queue is, is a result of what happens, you know, in the service time and arrival rate, basically. So the problem with queues is that we have variation. The arrival rate is not fixed, and, and neither is the, the service rate. And because the service time, the arrival rates, and all that, they fluctuate, we have this kind of a lose-lose situation because we cannot bank the time that, uh, in which we do nothing. If we, have a, if we have a CPU that doesn't have work, we can't use it later. The, the time just goes to waste. The capacity goes to waste. But if we're overloaded, the excess work accumulates in the queue. So we can only lose in this situation. And that's a problem. And the end result is that the queue is almost always either almost empty or very, very full. It's very hard to actually observe queues that are somewhere in the middle. And mathematically, this looks kind of like this. This model is known as the MM1 model, uh, basically a queue with one service center, but that doesn't matter. Most queues behave just like this. Maybe the, like the tiny variations to this uh, equation, but they behave kind of like this. The point here is that the queue capacity and the latency, the wait time, rises very, very sharply when uh, utilization, the ratio between the arrival rate and the service rate, becomes closer to 100%, okay? So the more utilization you have, the more you utilize the service center, the more you're gonna wait. And as you can see from this graph, this goes up very, very fast. So above around 75% utilization, you're going to be suffering very, very heavily. And most often, you want to be way, way below that line. Okay? So this is basically, that shows you uh, the queue capacity of an infinite queue, which I, I'm sure you don't have, right? 
And the implications are very clear. First of all, out of memory. If a queue can go to infinity very, very fast, yeah, your JVM is going to blow up. But way before that, you're going to get garbage collection pressure, GC storms, and all of that. You're going to suffer from high latency because your requests are going to wait in queue for a very, very long time. And of course, if requests wait in, in the queue long enough, they're going to be stale because the client is going to time out way before you give it a response, right? So the lesson here is just always limit the queue size. That should be obvious. Now, it is important to remember that latency, the graph we've seen before, is actually by in relative numbers. Like this is the penalty that you get, or actually, I should say, um, the amount that the latency would double. Now, this is all relative to the service time. Okay? So if service time is fast, well, the penalty might not be that much. For example, with utilization of 50%, the wait time is double. Well, double, uh, if you're using SSD, double not so bad. It's uh, maybe 100 uh, microseconds extra. Nobody cares about that. Not in a web service anyway. But if you're talking about a magnetic disk, the penalty is now 20 milliseconds with the same utilization. If you're talking about a web service that has latency of, uh, let's say, 1.5 seconds, you're talking about the one second penalty. That's a lot. Okay, so the point here, the lesson here, is that the, s and the slower the service center, the less utilization we can have. And this is a very, very important lesson that we need to remember. Now, utilization also fluctuates. Utilization is not fixed. And this has very dire results for the amount of utilization we can have. Because a 10% fluctuation, when we have a utilization of 5%, that only takes us to about, let's say, 55% utilization. It's not too much. The penalty in this case would be 10%, 110% of what we had. That's not so bad. But at 90%, 10% fluctuation takes us already to 10 times the latency. We would jump from, let's say, 1 second to 10 seconds. That's a huge jump. So running your systems at the edge of capacity is very, very dangerous. So you need to be very careful if you're overloading resources. So when you have peak loads, let's say maybe uh, Black Friday or whatever, you have to be very, very careful. And one way to do this, especially if you have highly varied load, is to cap the load or load shed. Now, practically what you would do, is you would have choke points. You would have some points in your system where you would throttle the load or load shed. Remove the load, drop it somewhere, maybe just reject it. And you need to plan in advance for this. So this is an example of how we do this kind of planning. Basically, we say, what is the latency of this stage? And we plan accordingly. We never go above 75% utilization unless it's a batch system. And of course, the slower the resource is, the more, the more capacity and the more overcapacity we're going to give it. We need to drive utilization down. So in this example, we have a database connection pool, which is much slower than the RPC thread pool. So the utilization will be 50% and not 75%. Now, of course, a front layer would accept as much traffic as it can and will push it backwards. And load will queue inside the system. So this is. Very, very relevant if you have a microservices architecture like we do. The front service will accept as much traffic as it can. We'll, we'll just uh, send it to other services, and they can't do anything about this. And load will queue up in your network and in your buffers and all of the queues that you have along the way. But this is, it's the same basically in every kind of server. So the way to resolve this is to have back pressure, basically telling the front I can't accept any more load. I'm overloaded. Don't, don't give me any more traffic. Stop this. Um, we need to communicate this somehow. Now, uh, a blogging, um, almost all protocols support this because you know, we're engineers. We thought about this. So for example, HTTP has a 503 response, which is basically back pressure. I cannot accept more load. I'm overloaded. And your servers need to support this. And your clients need to support this. If you see a 503 response, you should not retry. You should not send more load. You should back off for a while. Okay? And blogging code 
basically does this by default. You don't need to do anything, okay? If you have um, a blocking server, eventually all of your threads are going to be busy. You will stop accepting requests. Your clients will become blocked as well. Their clients will become blocked, and eventually the entire system will block and reject requests from the user, okay? So uh, blocking code is, you know, it has back pressure by default. By default, we don't need to do anything except maybe tune the number of threads. But anything that is a sync has to, be, to have some kind of explicit back pressure. For example, executors or remote network calls and so on and so on and so on. Okay? This is especially relevant if you're using, using something like Kafka because Kafka has no, has no back pressure. You can basically enqueue as much work as you want inside of Kafka. And if your producer is, for some reason, faster than the consumer, then, you know, the queue will go to infinity. You don't want that, do you? So now that we have back pressure and we have informed the front end that we cannot accept more load, the front end has to do something sensible with that, you know, access load. So this is load shedding, removing the extra load. And it's basically a trade-off between having good latency and high error rate, okay? We can either have you know, high latency and low error rate, or we can have good latency and reject the excess load and give out errors to the users. What kind of errors? Probably 502, okay? Backend unavailable, bad gateway. Bad gateway, upstream unavailable, which is uh, 503, you get the point, okay? A very interesting example of this is uh, what Facebook did. Read about this in this link. Uh, basically, they used the LIFO queue to uh, reject work, but they want to reject work that has li uh, very little chance of actually being served, okay? So read about it, it's very interesting. Um, I think there's a lot to learn here. Now let's talk about sizing thread pools, because, you know, um, if we side our th size our thread pools in a bad way, we will have queues inside our system, large queues. So the way um, a blocking server in this case, in our example, Jetty works, is we have Nginx, and we've got a socket, and anybody wants to take a guess what is between Nginx and the socket? Sorry? A queue, yes, we have a queue in, inside. That is the operating system backlog queue, or accept queue, listen queue. So when Nginx starts a TCP connection uh, with a socket, that new connection goes into queue, and then we have an acceptor thread a thread of, uh, uh, run by Jetty that accepts this new connection and puts it in another queue. And this is uh, the queue that, uh, that is connected to the executors where your, co where your code runs, okay? This is known as the queued thread pool or QTP, okay? And our code kind of lives here. Now, um, up to a certain version, that queue was unlimited. Um, they fixed it. Now the queue size is reasonable. It's pretty good now. It's well tuned, but a lot of people actually mistune this queue. Um, and you know, by a lot of people, I mean I've done it myself too. Um, and it's a really, really bad idea. You can probably guess the implication of mistuning that queue. So what happens if you have too many threads? Basically, you're overloading the operating system, and the operating system itself has a queue. That queue is the scheduler queue. Um, CPU is a limited resource and a lot of threads want to use it, and when those, thre those threads want to use the, the CPU, they have to wait in the scheduler queue. And the amount of the size of that queue, the amount of threads waiting in, uh, in the queue for a CPU, that is known as load average. This is the number we see when you do top, okay? Um, and of course, if you wait on the queue, you will have high latency. That's bad. And threads, of course, also take up memory and file descriptors and stuff like that. And how much memory do threads take by default? Does anyone know what is the stack size, the default stack size in Java? How much? One megabyte. One megabyte. You can tune it down, by the way. You can go as little as 224 kilobytes, but no, no less than that. And also you have you know, buffers, Java classes, and a lot of stuff that gets allocated by your web server or your code. So it takes up a lot of memory, not to mention file descriptors and so on. If you've got other shared resources like database connection pools, eventually, if you have too many threads, you're gonna have a problem. 
Okay? The end result of this is really bad quality of service, garbage collection storms, and really, really bad degradation behavior. On the other hand, if you don't have enough threads, work will queue up in Jetty queue or in the operating system socket queue. And of course, you won't be able to utilize the CPU because you won't have enough running threads to run on the CPU at all times. The end result of this would again be high latency and low resource utilization. So that's also bad. Basically, when we tune a system, we have a trade-off between capacity and latency. We cannot tune a system for both. That's impossible, unfortunately. Um, so if we tune for latency, for low latency, we need to have resources available for work um, whenever we need them. Whenever a piece of work comes, we want to tend to it immediately. So we need to have spare resources at all times. So we want to keep the queue as empty as possible. Okay? The way we do this is by blocking and applying back pressure keeping the queue very small, and over-provisioning resources. Because as you've seen, we need to keep utilization very low. On the other hand, if we're optimizing for capacity or throughput, and this is known as a batch system, we don't care about latency. So for maximum capacity usage, we want, that, uh, we want work to be available whenever a resource goes free. We don't want to have a resource that, that is doing nothing. Okay, so in this case, we would keep the queue very, very full. Um, probably an order of magnitude larger than the concurrency or the amount of work we can deal uh, simultaneously or the amount of service centers. Okay, uh, queuing, of course, increases latency, but that is fine in the batch system. Now, this formula shows you how to tune your system for an ideal number of threads. Okay, uh, let's say you have a web server, user-facing system, and you want to tune the number of threads. Uh, this is from Java Concurrency in Practice, a very, very good book. I highly recommend it. And basically what it says is that the number of threads should be equal to the number of calls time times the utilization percentage that you get from capacity planning, usually, um, times 1 plus the ratio between the I.O. or the wait time and the CPU time of your transaction. And this is, of course, all averages. And this is assuming that the CPU is a limiting resource, which is not always the case. Okay? Maybe memory is the limiting resource, or I.O., or whatever. Okay? The problem with this uh, in modern times is that if you have a grid, if you're running on a shared infrastructure, you don't necessarily know how many cores you have available. So not always you can use this formula, which is kind of unfortunate. Now, how do you use this formula? Of course, you need to get the um, you know, wait time and CPU time. The easiest way to do that is to look through your logs and find the transaction time, which is just W plus C, okay? The wait time plus uh, CPU time. And CPU time, you can deduce by taking the total CPU time consumed by your application and dividing it by the throughput, and then you just plug it in, and you got the numbers. Uh, utilization percentage, if you wanted to have you know, kind of a batch system would be somewhere between 80 and 90 percent because you want to leave some CPU for the operating system, the JVM, garbage collection, and so on. If you wanted to have uh, a system that has low latency, you would double this by 75 percent, so much lower. In reality, around 0.5 or 0.6. Okay, and of course, remember that you might have other resource limits. Now, what about the synchronous servers? How do they behave? Uh, unfortunately, asynchronous servers also have a queue, but it's kind of an implicit queue. So the way asynchronous servers work is, again, we have the operating system queue, and then we have system calls that take work from, this, uh, from the socket, uh, usually EPOL, which is a system call that gets uh, work from a lot of sockets sim simultaneously. And then we've got a bunch of other syscalls, maybe to resolve DNS or write to disk or that kind of stuff. And of course, we've got callbacks, our user space code that runs as a response to events. Okay? And the event loop basically circles between those things. It goes, calls EPOL, calls the callback to uh, do something with you know, uh, the data that you got from the network. Now, all of the callbacks go into a queue. Sometimes it's more than one queue, depending on the architecture of the specific asynchronous framework. But there is al always at least one queue. And what happens if you enqueue callbacks faster than the event loop can handle them? What, can, what will happen? High latency, exactly. 
You will have very high latency, but not for one request. You will have high latency for all requests because all of them wait in this queue, okay? But the problem is that the event loop can block, and that is very, very bad because then it slows down. So event loops can block, and what do you think is blocking, for example? What would block the event loop? A syscall would block the event, uh, the event loop, but what else can block the event loop? I will not block the event queue. Uh, what, sorry? Sorry? Computation, CPU. CPU is blocking. So if you, do, if you have a, a one callback, one uh, user space code, one piece of user space code that executes a lot of CPU, has a lot of CPU time, it will block the event loop and it will destroy the quality of service to other requests. And that is very important to remember. But and as people said here, syscalls can also block the event loop. For example, DNS queries, they can also block the event loop. And this is a real world problem that we face with, uh, for example, uh, Node.js. And that's a really, really painful problem. Also, there is no inherent concurrency limit. Uh, when we want to tune the blocking server, all we have to do is basically, uh, you know, control the number of threads that we have. How do you control the concurrency of an async system? It can get as many uh, requests as, uh, as it gets, and it will uh, enqueue as many callbacks as it will enqueue. There's really no easy way to control this. And of course, there's no back pressure by default. And there's an asterisk here because reactive streams kind of solve this problem, okay? They allow you to have back pressure in a synchronous system. So because we don't have preemption, that means we have really bad quality of service. Um, if we don't do a deal with back pressure manually or use reactive streams or something like that, we will have overload. And those systems are pretty hard to tune because it's very hard to limit the concurrency and the queue size of, uh, of an asynchronous system. It's also hard to debug, but that's like really out of the scope of this uh, talk. So what's the point of asynchronous servers? The point of the synchronous servers is to have high concurrency because they don't take a lot of memory per connection. So we can have a lot of connections at the same time. That does not mean that we can support high rates of uh, high throughput of requests. Okay? That is not the same as concurrency, and we'll be talking about that in a bit. Another advantage is that we can have more control because we can actually have fine-grained control of timeouts. Uh, we can just stop serving requests in the middle and so on. Threads are hard to cancel in, in the middle. So it's a good fit for I.O.-heavy servers. Um, this whole you know, space is still evolving and it's worth visiting in a few years. Uh, you should remember that operating systems that we use today were developed for synchronous blocking uh, code. They were not developed for, for a synchronous code and we're still seeing a lot of improvements in operating systems in that space. So now we're gonna talk about a very powerful mathematical law that is known as Little's Law that is used in queuing theory and system design and uh, system analysis and a lot of other stuff. And that is very, very, very useful for resilient design. So basically that law states that uh, the number of clients in the system, the average number of clients in the system, uh, equals the average throughput times the average latency, okay? Now this is, seems very, very simple, but this was actually very, very hard to prove mathematically. And the reason is, is because Little's law holds for all distributions. Okay? It doesn't matter what distribution you have, Little's law holds as long as you're talking about the stable system, not going to go into the mathematical definition of stable. Um, basically what, what it means is, you know, use your intuition, it means a system that doesn't change too much over time. Okay? But it does hold for all those systems. And it also holds for the subsystems. So we can do analysis separately for a system and then the subsystem and the subsystem of that, of that subsystem and so on. And we can compare the results. And then we can detect how many clients we have in this subsystem and how many clients we have in that subsystem. And that is very, very helpful. Okay? So I'll give you an example. So if you remember the, the demo that we showed before, um, I can actually take the, those numbers here of uh, average number of uh, 200 milliseconds and just start, start to do a computation. So let's open IPython and do a quick computation of Little's Law. 
Okay, so 0 0.2, uh, 0 0.2 seconds, and I want to see the throughput, which I have over here. And the throughput is about 30 uh, operations per second, so I'm going to plug it in here, times 30, and that tells me I have six clients inside of the system. Now, I have computed this for Jetty, for my web server, so that means I have six uh, clients inside my system, so I'm going to have a look at how many uh, Jetty threads are busy. And it tells me 10, okay? But Jetty thread pool also, uh, also uses two acceptor threads and two um, selector threads. So actually, that gives me exactly six threads that execute my code. So Little's Law has predicted accurately how many uh, clients I have inside the system. Now, if I do the same computation for the load balancer, which has much higher latency, that's, uh, that's uh, 1.75, something like that. So 1.75 times 30, it's the same throughput. And I get 52 clients inside the system. So basically, I have 52 clients waiting inside the queue, inside the system. So I can actually know how many clients are waiting, how many clients are queued inside the system without having a direct measurement of the queue inside. That is very important because, as you remember, most of the queues in your system are hidden. You cannot get a direct measurement of those queues. Okay? And Lita's law is the only way of knowing what exactly is happening inside of your system. So one second. So the kind of stuff we do with Lita's law is deducing how many uh, clients or how many requests are stuck inside the system, verifying load tests and benchmarks, for example, because if a load test shows you numbers that uh, for which load, uh, Little's law do not hold, does not hold, that means there is something wrong with the load generator or the statistics of the, uh, the load test. And you would be surprised how many load tests and how many load generator tools are just broken. They don't report the correct numbers. And I urge you to do this computation yourselves and, and verify the numbers and see how many tools are broken. Um, you should go and look at Gil Tanner's excellent talk about uh, benchmarking, how not to measure latency. And also, benchmarking blunders and things that go bump in the night, where they actually have a very good example of uh, applying Little's law to, uh, to verify the results of a load test, and finding that this load test was indeed faulty. So last thing I'm going to talk about is timeouts. And timeouts is a very painful subject. Um, people get this wrong all the time. People use arbitrary timeout values all the time. How do I know they use arbitrary time val timeout values? Basically, I see a, a multiple of 10. If it's a multiple of 10, you know it's bullshit. Nobody thought about this number. Um, and I'll give you a few examples of things we see in the wild. Um, database time timeout that is gr greater than the overall transaction timeout. Uh, you have a transaction that should take one second, and then you see a database timeout of 10 seconds. That doesn't make any sense, does it? Or maybe a cache timeout that is larger than the database latency. The cache is supposed to be an order of magnitude faster than the database. If it's not, what is the point of having a cache? If you wait for one second for a cache and then you go to the database, that's weird. So the timeout for the, for the cache should be, let's say, 10 milliseconds, but usually you see timeouts as high as one second. Again, it doesn't make any sense. Huge unrealistic timeouts. And the problem is often that people refuse to return errors and they try their best to serve a transaction no matter what. But this is basically um, optimizing locally and it hurts you globally. Now, as a side note, connection timeout, read timeout, and transaction timeouts are not the same thing. People get this wrong all the time. A connection timeout, for example, would be the time it takes you to connect uh, to initiate a TCP connection. A request timeout would be the amount of time it takes you to serve an HTTP request. Those are two very, very different numbers. Within data center, it should take you about a millisecond and a half to initiate a TCP connection. But the HTTP request itself might take 10 seconds because you're transferring a large amounts of data. Okay? So very, very different um, you know, scales of numbers, very, very different use cases. So very important to actually read the documentation of what the timeouts actually mean. 
Now, how do you decide on timeout? First thing that you, you want to look at is the distribution, a histogram. For example, you might want to look at something that looks like this. Okay, so this is a distribution of an HTTP transaction. In this case, it's a very normal distribution, which is kind of odd. It's not, uh, it's not very common. Uh, often, it would look something like this. This is a, a real-world distribution from one of my servers, okay? And you can actually see that New Relic also supports a histogram. And you can see that I have one peak here and a smaller peak over here that is kind of smudged. So two types of transactions. One is very fast and the other one is very uh, slow. And that helps you decide on timeout because on a histogram, you can actually see how many, uh, what percentage of requests you will arrow out on uh, given a, uh, a timeout that you decide on, okay? Um, and again, you should watch out for multiple modes because as you've seen in the real world histogram, you might have multiple types of transactions on the same histogram. But the most important thing here is context. What is this transaction used for, okay? Can you um, reject this transaction or should you wait longer because this transaction is important? Is this maybe a monitor um, a financial transfer? Okay, and then you might want to wait longer on that transaction. It's all about context. Every timeout has to be derived from some real world constraints. Constraint. It cannot be arbitrary. Okay, an arbitrary timeout is the worst mistake you can make. So, what kind of constraints are we talking about? First of all, humans, because we build systems for humans. And humans have time frames that they behave uh, upon, on. For example, um, our eyes, you know, um, they perceive motion, and anything that is below 20 milliseconds, you know, seems smooth to us. And this is why you have televisions that have 60 frames per second, okay? The implication is that if you build a system for animation, it has to respond faster than 20 milliseconds, okay? Um, when we're talking about delay perception, how long it takes us to see that something is happening, okay, that is delayed, we start to feel the delay, okay? After that, we wanna have a spinner because the user, the user will be upset. We're talking about 300 milliseconds, give or take. So you get the idea. There are a lot of those numbers. Um, if you care about that stuff, there's a link here, UX powers of 10, and Google made a lot of research about this. They have the, something called the rail model, which I highly recommend that you read. Another real world constraint is hardware, okay? And again, those are numbers that every programmer should know by heart. The speed of RAM access, about 10 nanoseconds. The speed it takes to, access, to do a disk sync on SSD, about between 50 and 150 uh, microseconds. Uh, a round trip in the data center, that should be around uh, um, half a millisecond, okay? Even in Amazon, it's sub-second. If, if you're talking about sending data between uh, a wide area network, you're talking about 150 milliseconds, and so on, so on, so on. This means, for example, if someone tells you that they need to do an interactive transaction that spans two data centers, you have a problem because there's no way you can send packets or a significant amount of data between data centers and still get a response within 300 milliseconds, okay? So, yeah, you get the point. There's a nice pattern called timeout budget that is very popular on microservices, um, but you can also implement this in your service. Basically, the problem is that you have a global timeout but every um, stage of processing your system has a timeout that is completely out of sync with the rest of the system. For example, you might have one second global timeout, but then a database timeout of one second, and an HTTP timeout of one second, and that adds up to two seconds. So instead what we do is we have the global timeout and we pass it to all the, to all the system in a context object, and whenever we do something, we, uh, we um, subtract the amount of time it took to execute that from the global, uh, from the budget, and the timeouts are set based on that budget. So we cannot go over budget. If we don't have enough time, we will use the timeout to accommodate the budget that we have. So in this example, um, processing could have had a larger timeout, but there was not enough budget. We only had 371 milliseconds left in the budget, so we reduced the timeout accordingly. And when you run out of budget, you stop processing the request. You cancel the request. Why? 
because you cannot go under budget, and there's no point processing the requests if you don't have enough time left. Okay, so in the microservices architecture, this is very useful, and the way to do this is you need to send the context or the, the budget remaining through your protocol to all the services. Okay, so you basically transmit this from service to service to service. There's another nice pattern that is more useful in synchronous systems, which is called the debt buyer. So basically, you know, maybe you lend some money to a friend or someone you know, and uh, he doesn't give you the money back, and after a year, like, okay, I gave up. He's never going to give me the money. But you sell that debt to someone else. They do that in the U.S. Don't ask me why Americans are weird. Um, and then the debt buyer would never, never, ever give up. And he would chase that someone forever. So it's the same pattern, really. Um, you do request. You time out after a while, let's say uh, one second, but you spin off some synchronous process, a future, uh, an actor, whatever, to, w to wait longer because the response might, might still return, maybe after 10 seconds or whatever. And when you get this response, you can do something useful with it asynchronously. Maybe log it or maybe spin off another computation based on the response, okay? Now, you can't really do this if a client is waiting for this response, but often this is not the case and you can do something useful with it. So for an asynchronous system, uh, this is very, very useful. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, now is a good time. If you are doing a few parallel requests to the downstream system, you pass the same budget, uh, the same timeout budget to all of them. But what if the first one got cancelled? Uh, others still still are being processed, or you have something to cancel them as well? So do you mean uh, if we do requests in parallel or in Yes, serial? yes. Let's say... So, <laughs> okay. So first of all, we don't do requests in parallel uh, because of a different reason, because of our experiment system. Um, so we don't have this problem. But if we did do requests in parallel, then we would send another signal to cancel requests. And this is what actually uh, companies, uh, other companies do. Okay, so thank you very much. I'll be outside if you want to talk to me. <laughs>